the, the Anglo-Saxon nature of the illustrations we can show from comparisons with manuscripts made in Anglo-Saxon England 50 and 100 years earlier. Um, and I will show you some pictures of those. Um, the script, you'll have to take my word for it um, without other manuscripts beside me, um, is uh, more likely the work of a, a Norman than of an Englishman. But if it's not, then it's a Norman trained scribe. And we're left not knowing the ethnicity, but at least knowing the, the styles of the writing and the pen and drawings combine Norman and Anglo Saxon in Anglo Norman England. We begin with two blank leaves, 17th century dedication there. And then the first page of the text begins with this decorated letter B. This is not the beginning of the Gospel as we know it. It's the letter of Jerome to Pope Damasus uh, introducing his Latin translation of the Gospels, beginning Beato Pape Damaso Hieronymus. Beato, initial B, reminds us of Beatus, the opening of the Psalter, and there is a long tradition of a decorated B at the beginning of Psalters. Then there follows the various prefaces and explanations at the beginning of the Gospels, and then we have a blank opening, and we start St Matthew's Gospel. Now, here an evangelist portrait that one expects to face the beginning of the Gospel. The portrait within the frame is very much within a 10th, 11th century Anglo-Saxon tradition with antecedents. And aspects of the image can be compared with other manuscripts. The angle at which the pen is held, the scroll coming across the body of the evangelist, the loop in the curtain can all be paralleled. But instead of having the text facing, we have this frame with gold and paint decoration. And in it, in gold lettering, the beginning of the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the first words of the Gospel in Latin. But the frame looks like it's not meant for these few words. Now, if we take a photograph of this page in ultraviolet light, we find that inside that frame there is a sketch of the evangelist. And clearly the original intention was to have the evangelist on the right-hand page, but this has been uh, erased and the space filled with these few words, and then the Gospel continues over the page. Now, I turn to St Mark's Gospel, where we begin with a frame at the left-hand side, and no portrait of the Evangelist. So in this sense, unfinished here, a decorated P at the beginning of the Gospel. Now, move on to the Gospel of Luke, and we have a blank leaf, and then the beginning of the argument, the prologue to the Gospel, with a capital L, some space, and the Gospel begins here with the decorated letter Q. It looks like an angel rather than an evangelist in the letter Q. Uh, on this leaf we can actually see a little bit of cloth sewn to the parchment. Uh, this is missing from others but the slit is there and it suggests that there was once a little silk tag that allowed you to turn to the beginning of the Gospels 
and that would be useful now as I'm turning to the beginning of the next Gospel, which is St John. Now, here Luke ends, we turn the page, and here is the start of the prologue to St John's Gospel. Again, there's a, the remains of a silk tag. The Gospel itself begins over the page with the letter I in Principio Era Verbum, in the beginning was the word. And the full page picture in a frame is now facing not the beginning of the Gospel, but the prologue to the Gospel. And it's not an evangelist portrait, but a scene from the climax of the Gospel narrative. What this scene depicts is on the right three women within the frame approaching an angel seated at this rather strange looking structure. This is a very recognisable image um, with a long tradition behind it and a long development ahead of it. It is the three Marys in the garden visiting the empty tomb on the first Easter morning. So here we have the angel sitting at the empty tomb. And here are the Roman soldiers falling asleep. There are other examples where the soldiers are standing holding their spears. But this, taking the narrative uh, uh, more seriously, it depicts the sleeping soldiers by having them lying down. This is really very interesting. It depicts what we call the Edicule in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that stands over the burial place of Christ. Right over the sepulchre itself, there has stood, since the church was built in the 4th century, a small structure called the Edicule. But this, with its pepper pot top, is identifiable as not the original 4th century edicule, but the, the edicule rebuilt about 1012, which remained in the Holy Sepulchre until it was rebuilt again in the 16th century. Through the Middle Ages and as late as the um, early 16th century, there are other depictions of the edicule, but our artist is not simply trying to envisage the gospel narrative of a rock-cut tomb with the stone rolled away. He's given us a depiction of the tomb of Christ as he knows it to be seen in his own time. And he must have had models for depicting the Edicule, uh, possibly literally models, uh, clay or metalwork models, um, the pilgrims from uh, the Holy Land could bring back with them, possibly from other depictions. But in scenes of the Three Marys at the tomb, this is very unusual in actually giving us a lifelike edicule. So instead of an evangelist portrait at the start of the Gospel, we have a narrative scene, and it doesn't face the start of the Gospel, it faces the argumentum. Here is another anomalous aspect of the book. The colour of the red ink here is actually quite different from the red ink used by the Anglo-Saxon artist. And the style of drawing here, this is a big flower capital, is actually a style from 40 or 50 years later than this. So it appears that the original scribe has left space here for the artist to add decoration at the start of the argument to St John's Gospel and that decoration was not added. Forty years later someone has fitted in the initial H 
but not really use the space very well. So we have a gap here, and the H comes rather too close to the lettering here. So, between the four Gospels, we have none that exactly conforms to the pattern of an evangelist's portrait facing the beginning of the Gospel. There's inconsistency about whether we begin with a prologue or begin with the Gospel itself. In the case of Matthew, we have the evangelist's portrait, but it was attempted twice. In the case of St Mark, we have the panel, but no portrait inside it. With Luke's Gospel, there is no panel and apparently no intention of one. The text began on the left-hand page. But St Luke's Gospel got a rather fine initial cue. And here we have the panel, perhaps in the wrong place, and depicting not the evangelist, but a scene traditionally uh, illustrated from within the Gospel. Now, this variety and the sense of false starts, change of plan, suggests that the artist and scribe working together don't really have a strategy to produce the four Gospels in a long-established tradition. They're working out how to do it for themselves. This seems surprising if one considers that individual drawings can be shown to have antecedents. So the, the artist is not inexperienced, he has seen other drawings, but the putting together of the Gospel book appears to be inexperienced. Now, here I'm going to show a parallel. This is the portrait of St Matthew. If I hold up beside it a photograph from a manuscript made perhaps 60 years earlier, this is the Grimbold Gospels, and we have an evangelist portrait here. This is actually St John, one can see the eagle of St John here, but you see the pen held the scroll of the Gospel across his body. The curtain here taking a loop. Now here we see why the curtain takes a loop. It's wrapped round the chair on which the evangelist is sitting. So all of those are similar features. A distinct feature is the feet here pointing inwards, here pointing outwards. The frame here is much simpler than the very elaborate frame here with figures in the panel. The Grimbald Gospels are a luxury gospel book made perhaps in Canterbury, perhaps in Winchester, uh, around 1020. Now, with the depiction of the three Marys, at the beginning of St John's Gospel, we can compare an image from an earlier Anglo-Saxon Gospel book. We see the three Marys, the angel, and the soldiers asleep. Here, the benediction of St Athelwold from Winchester in the 970s we have the three Marys standing across the border, the angel with the hand raised as to bless. And at the left-hand side, you can see there's several soldiers with their spears standing in the border. But the depiction of the tomb looks like a, a stylized church, whereas the modern Gospels has this very interesting almost lifelike depiction of the EDQ. Comparisons of this kind help us to think in terms of where a manuscript such as this might have been made. But the number of books that we have with which to make the comparison is very small 
And the ones that have survived are, for the most part, luxury books um, like the Benediction of St. Athelwald or the Grimwald Gospels. I can show you what I mean about the depiction of the Edicule as it was in the 11th century. This is Martin Biddle's book on the Tomb of Christ, and he gives us drawings and plans of the Edicule as it was originally built in the 4th century, as it was rebuilt in 1012, as it was rebuilt in 1555, and as it was rebuilt in this more Turkish style in 1809. And we are dealing with this, the second Edicule, um, and he gives us here some depictions of the Edicule in the 15th century. So though these are much later than the Water Gospels, this is before the third rebuild. This is the Edicule of which a small model or drawing had been seen by our artist. So if the question is, where was a book of this kind made? Where was this book made? The view I would take is that we don't have enough information about how many workshops were producing books of this kind in England in the late 11th century. The fact that we can make comparisons with some deluxe manuscripts for which we have reason to think they were made in Canterbury or Winchester doesn't mean that this was necessarily made in the same place. The artist can have seen models. The scribe is clearly a perfectly competent scribe. But the evidence of the way the book is put together with its illustrations suggests this is not produced in an experienced workshop. And I think we have no reason to think that it would have been made somewhere like Winchester or Canterbury by experienced craftsmen. There could have been workshops in many English towns or possibly in some abbeys where work of this kind could have been carried out. Um, and it doesn't, to my mind, diminish the interest of this gospel book that in its putting together it is somewhat amateur. Its particular interest, though, is surely the evidence of an Anglo-Saxon scribe, um, an Anglo-Saxon artist working with a scribe who is either a Norman or trained in the Norman tradition. It gives us a relic from the first generation after the Norman conquest, and that is very important.